Welcome to the PAX Podcast, where we are living and sharing the gospel of peace. I am Brian Lucas. With me is Mandy Lucas, who is one of our co-lead pastors alongside me here at PAX Church, and Lucas Kaiser, who is uh, unrelated, but... Um, <laughs> But also, still a Lucas. Still yeah. a Lucas and uh, uh, a house church pastor and uh, one of our elders here at PAX. We are looking at uh, reviewing our message, our scriptures from Sunday, and taking a look through, trying to dig a little deeper, dive into what uh, is in these and some of the stuff that maybe doesn't make it into the message, and then where we can go from there as far as learning to take this and have it mean something in our lives to live and share the gospel of peace. So if you're watching uh, this or listening somewhere um, and this speaks to you or is useful, uh, would you engage with it and you know, click like or share it with somebody who might want to hear this. And um, if you learn anything or something like that, let us know. Also, uh, send us any questions or anything else because we want to be able to engage those things and not just be uh, a one-way uh, communication because the Bible and God's Word are best learned in community. Yeah? Amen. All right. So um, this week, I got to preach. We're still in our Living by Faith series. We're going through Hebrews 11. And this time we're on verse 27. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be... Nope, that's... I'm reading 24. I said the right number, but I read the wrong verse. Okay, try again. Verse 27. <laughs> Hebrews 11:27. 27. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. And so everything we talked about uh, was related related to that um, scripture, and that's kind of our jumping off point and our anchor point for this series, right? So as we're jumping away from our main text, we're taking a look at uh, where it connects in the Old Testament, but making sure that we filter everything we're looking at in the Old Testament through this New Testament verse lens, so we're not just talking about whatever, because there's so much back there, especially like t this week in Exodus, like I think I scanned through about seven chapters uh, for pieces of the message. So anyway, um, from Sunday, what'd you guys uh, think? What, um, how'd that come together? Any initial thoughts, questions, comments on where we, where we went? It was a lot of information. It was a lot of information. <laughs> there was a lot there. <laughs> there was, and I cut out a ton. <clears throat> Mandy, thoughts? No thoughts. Uh, podcast face. <laughs> podcast face. Um, <laughs> no, I thought it was a great message. Um, it was really good. I loved that you you sort of brought it all back around um, to the statement where you said, by faith we do not fear this world because of who God is. Um, because the, uh, God is who is, who was, and who always will be is with us. That's a better, uh, if you want to say it that way, I guess. Ironically, I he just did read say your it that way. That you were so, um, <laughs> let's try that again. Try that again. Um, by faith, we do not fear this world because the God who is, who was, and who always will be is with us. And yeah. I just, I thought that was a great um, takeaway from this by faith. Moses um, didn't fear the king's anger he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. And I think that you, mm -hmm. you had kind of a challenge here um, with this particular verse. I know that when I was reading um, some of the commentaries about it, uh, there's a big um, sort of division line here on the interpretation of this, depending on which commentary you go with on, on the win of this by faith statement. And so I tend to agree with um, where you land on it in your message um, and with the commentaries that also landed there that this is, is talking about the event, the Exodus event mm -hmm. itself and not just the first time he flees Egypt in fear, but um, because he does flee in fear. And you made that point um, in, the, in the message, but I thought it was interesting. Um, a lot of the commentaries that argued against that you know, they, they argue it by placement of the timeline in, in the text. Um, yeah. and, and even that, I don't, I don't know that I would even agree, um, with their argument. With their what? argument in the commentaries. Yeah. Okay. Do you think, so do you guys think that I, cause I had the same experience as I'm looking through the two places they want to put it 
are either when Moses flees after he, um, when he, when Moses leaves Egypt, he does it twice. And what they're, the thing that they did, which I think it, it just, it's so um, echoes through so much of hermeneutics and uh, there's that word again. Um, what, is that word? what does that mean, Brian? <laughs> it's interpreting scripture, how you interpret scripture. And so much of hermeneutics gets locked into these weird, narrow, like artificial rules that don't actually make sense or come from the text. It's like, I came up with this box and so I'm just going to move the box around until I can see everything I want to see there. And and so people go, okay, well, he left Egypt, so that's the part I'm going to focus on. So he left Egypt either when he flees from Pharaoh after killing the Egyptian or when they're all the way out of Egypt in, um, you know, in the Exodus on the other side of the Red Sea or heading toward the Red Sea. And they go, and so like most of the commentaries, if they picked a side, tended to land back on Moses fleeing Egypt, even though like... Be- and their reasoning for it was the following verse after 27 is, by faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And, and so it's like, well, it goes more with that than it does with the other, but it doesn't. It's the lead up into that. And it's this, like, as Moses is getting ready to leave, as Moses is leaving, and, and I think it's saying, by faith he left, along with, you know, all of Israel, without fear of the king. And then um, as well, the next uh, thing, it, go, it digs deeper, and he kept the Passover, and this was a thing. And then they, they did this, and, and it's just adding layers to what's happening there. But it makes no sense to say he's, he wasn't afraid. By faith, he was unafraid. And then have that somehow referencing when he flees from Pharaoh for fear of his life. Anyway, what, because it literally says, like, it doesn't say much in Exodus about that, but it does say, and then Moses was afraid and he ran. So, mm-hmm. Lucas, thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, that's, that seems to be what it says. Like, I, I'm, I'm looking at it and I can see where you, like, on just a, a cursory, like, reading might go, oh, the first time he left. Mm-hmm. But just finishing out the sentence, um, he didn't see the invisible God until the burning bush. Right. And that is the basis for where the faith is. So that had to have occurred first in order for that faith. That is, that is what the crux of the faith is based upon. Right. right. And that can't be a cause for his faith in that moment to leave without fear if he hasn't already seen the burning bush. Correct. Right? Yeah. So, so I... It, it, my issue with commentaries is that is that there seems to be a lot of complication mm-hmm. when a, a simple reading and just kind of understanding how it's structured would would clear that up or at least bring a lot more clarity and go uh, yeah that that makes sense like yeah. cause and effect right. <laughs> right right and so that was that was the hard thing like every once in a while I feel like it happens more than it should but I feel like so many commentaries are, um, I don't know if they're like rushed into production or what, especially on newer ones, like they don't often really dig into a lot of like scholarship and background and they don't flesh out every single aspect of the verse so that you can get a really broad understanding. They almost more come off like, like, I mean, in Bible college, one of the things that we had to do was journal through or like make notes on every single verse as we went through the scripture. And so we were supposed to build an entire commentary, like our own personal commentary uh, through the entire book of Matthew, I think was the one that we had to actually do that with. And we had some other places where we had to add to that and whatnot. And so I have a bunch of spots where like I have all these notes and comments going through and, and kind of use some formatting things from the commentaries and Bible study notes and whatnot. But I mean, I feel like I get more productive and useful uh, notes for study, not out of commentaries, but out of like deeper research tools and then just my study Bibles. Yeah. Like the study Bible has the same thing as the commentaries. It just doesn't cost as much because the commentaries are like 40 bucks per book, uh, per like book of the Bible that they comment on. So they're like super expensive to access those. And then you get into it and it's like, you didn't even give me anything that was actually helpful to teach this or know what's... Or they like, just skip the verse. Yeah, or they, yeah, or they just <laughs> skip it. And you're like, what? how did you just like pass over that? Like a lot of the commentaries even don't even address that particular verse. And they just go, this whole section is talking about Moses. That's found in Exodus. Bye. You know, <laughs> you're like, hang on. <laughs> That's not how this works. Right, Mandy? Right. 
Yes. <laughs> I like commentaries. Side note. Uh, no, I do. I do enjoy them. I just sometimes it's hard to find one that like particular like this. Like they make a comment, but they don't really conclude the thought, and so they they're not always that helpful. I didn't find the commentaries as useful in trying to study this um, because it more shared opinion rather than like making a case or showing like how it could connect on either side of that. I agree with you. I agree. Okay. We're all in agreement. <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm well, nodding. If you can't hear that, I'm nodding. So we skimmed through a ton of info uh, on this and, and leaning into this idea of by faith, not being in fear of the rulers of this world or of uh, powers that aren't of God and kind of established that like one of the biggest things is this sort of like battle of the deities in this part of Exodus, right? And before God sends Moses back in, before, you know, he gives him this, this point that it brings up in Hebrews eleven twenty seven that he pers- he's able to persevere because he saw him who is invisible and he sees him who is invisible in the burning bush. And so we had to hit that right? Mm -hmm. We had to talk about that. Um, and then, and try not to spend too, too much time on it. Um, and then, and then we needed to get it a little bit. I thought we needed to get into the plagues a little bit and some of that interaction to show how this, you know, like what would make Pharaoh an intimidating or, um, competing figure for the idea of really following Yahweh in this moment. That was my intent anyway. Uh, I don't know how that came off. Yeah, I thought you did a good job. Um, there was a point in the message where you were, you were explaining that Pharaoh considers himself a god. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about you know, his response to Moses when Moses tells him who sent him. Um, he's like, I don't know this God. And you did, well, I forget what you said. What did you say about the, the gods like hanging out together? I well, I thought it was, <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, do you really not remember? I really do not remember. I don't know what you're saying. I mean, it, like if you said it, I might like, oh yeah, I did do say Do you that. know what it, I'm talking about, it, Lucas? I don't what know what you're in my about. head when you said it, I was thinking like all the gods are hanging around like a poker table. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, was, I don't know this guy. <laughs> like, yeah, like yeah, who's yeah, this guy like coming in? I don't know who that guy is. Um, but it was, yeah, you kind of painted this picture of like the gods, like little G, you know, um, all those deities that are being <laughs> little, little G. G. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew that's what you thought. Um, are, are, you know, hanging out together and then the God of the universe presents himself and they don't know him and refuse to acknowledge who he is or who he possibly could be. Um, and so I, I did appreciate that you, you sort of talked about this message in in two realms you know the mm. spiritual um yeah. reality that's happening and then our temporal re- re- reality of what's mm. actually what we're actually experiencing and i think most of the time when we read this we just read for the physical we just read for what's happening here and now and we forget that there is this whole other element um happening you know yeah all things are spiritual yeah. Right? All Absolutely. things are spiritual. The, the deeper reality, the lasting permanent reality is spiritual. And so that's kind of the biggest piece of this. And then it also recognizing that because that was the, that was the religious reality for Egypt. Mm-hmm. Like I, we're not just saying that just to make Pharaoh like the big bad that we can, you know, all come together and hate. You know, it's, it's not just like, let's make him look as mean as possible so that we can hate him. Like, no, the guy really is terrible. And there's this heretical claim, blasphemous claim that he is the representation of the most powerful deity. Uh, And that's just not who he truly is. That's who God is. And ultimately that's who Jesus is, but that's not, uh, that's not Pharaoh. And so Moses is standing in some ways as a type of Christ, right? Um, Being like a foreshadowing of this one who is anointed and sent to speak on behalf of God. And, and lead his people. Uh, but then there's also the, um, the pointing forward toward uh, God's ultimate deliverance that each of these things, and especially in the Passover that Mandy's going to talk about next week, it's the strongest uh, foreshadowing of like, this is what Christ is going to do. Death is going to pass. So I'll save that for next week. We don't have to get into it now because there's a lot there. But um, so about the plague. So I will I will totally um, some of the stuff about the deities uh, the, the and the deification of 
um, Pharaoh, as well as a lot of the other stuff going on um, in, in the plagues. Um, I listened to a podcast, Mandy listened to part of it with me, uh, from the Bible Project, and it was phenomenal so good and not in a like this said everything that i knew i wanted to say already but it added a lot of valid context that like everything whereas like with the commentaries i'm reading this stuff and i'm looking at this giant gap that they're ignoring in like addressing the text in a way that's helpful the bible project is like going through and really digging in and thematically engaging all these and i i added some other supplemental stuff because they acknowledged that um um, what is it? They acknowledged that, um, sorry, there was a, there's a question on the screen and I totally read it and lost my train of thought, um, on the Instagram live that's here. <clears throat> they acknowledged that there is a, a connection between the plagues and the deities of Egypt, mm -hmm. but they didn't really get into that. So I had to look for that elsewhere because I was aware of that as well. I went into this knowing, like I've read through these a bunch of times in the past. I read through them a couple of times this time. Then I go read all the commentaries, you know, like I have my own notes and ideas and I've got some questions that I'm already starting to ask as I'm reading the text and going, ooh, I think this is a good point. I wanna check and make sure I'm not crazy. I don't wanna preach heresy. I wanna check myself. And so a lot of reading the commentaries is checking myself for heresy, right? I'm checking myself for accuracy or I'm trying to get like, oh, that's interesting. Is that significant or am I just reading that weird in English? And so I'll start looking at Greek words and Hebrew words and I'll start digging into like that's where I start going deeper into that is I want to check that what I'm seeing here makes sense so that I can give the right guide rails for then when we dig in at house church and that kind of thing. Right. Um, and so I was as I was doing this. There's a lot that's just like all clicking together. Like I'm, I'm in my head, I'm seeing all these dots start to connect as I'm listening to this Bible Project podcast talking about all these themes that I got into just briefly in the message. And I, I just thought it was so cool how they like explain this like three by three grid and how like there's a pattern across. Like if you lay them out in a grid, like, you know, one, two, three, one, two, th you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, for the first nine plagues and, and that. And if you lay those out that way, there's a really cool process where the first one of each of those sets of three has the same language and they're talking about it. And I'm like, whoa, that sounds cool. And then I went and looked and I was like, oh yeah, that's really clearly there. There's a very clear pattern to how that is. And probably some of that is displayed that way because it makes it easier to memorize it in small sets because it was passed on orally for a very long time, right? But then it's also true. And so that doesn't make it not true. Um, but, it, uh, but it also like there's slightly different contextual presentations of each piece of this. And it keeps starting like it's first thing in the morning, go confront Pharaoh at the river for the first fourth and seventh. Um, and then the middle one, it just kind of like there's a time period in between, but then God just says, now do this other one. Like the first one, there's always an engagement with Pharaoh about that plague as it's happening. But the second one, it's like, go to him, or no, the second one each time, it, it's go to him. So they like show up in his chambers and they like show up in the palace and they're like, hey, we're going to do this now because you won't let the people go. And then they release this other plague. And then the third one, it's always just do it. And they turn and they're like, we relieved the frogs. Now let's do this one, you know, or whatever. Like now I'm going to smack the ground and make gnats come. And, uh, and it's just like that that same pattern happens each time where God and, and God's kind of escalating toward this death of the firstborn where he's kind of wiped out Egypt's entire thing. But anyway, so showing my cards a little there, there's some of the background history, but um, what do you guys think about all of that stuff? And did it have the same effect for you as I'm speaking to some of these themes? Does it resonate and you go, yeah, yeah, I totally see that. Or do you then read through and go, where'd you get all that stuff? That's crazy talk. You know, I listen to the podcast also, so I see it. So maybe, <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe Lucas would be uh, well, a but, bit. but you listened to that, but did you have the same thing I did where I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or did you hear it and go, no, no, no about that one. You know what I mean? 
Um, no, I went back through and I definitely see. So they talked a little bit about the grouping of them, um, how they relate in that grid and the movements um, escalating. I definitely see all of those things. And um, I did think that that was really neat that um, one, four and seven all start out in the morning, go to Pharaoh. Um, and the first one's really cool because it's like in the morning, go to him in the Nile, which is like you know, Moses' origin story. So um, is going to Pharaoh's daughter in the Nile. You know, yeah, um, I love, I just, I love the beauty of the scripture and that and the way, um, the way that the Bible is written. I just love it. So um, I thought that was, that was really cool. I actually had a different question. So if Lucas wants to comment on that, I'm going to like. I have a question too. Yeah, so you go, you go. Um, So, not listening to that podcast, uh-huh. I, 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 and not having followed up, um, yeah. it makes sense though. Like, okay, God tends to operate in those kinds of structures when He does certain tasks. There is a usually a pattern there that is part of it. So you can identify who's responsible, um, right? And and so it's clear. It's like there's no ambiguity as to oh no, this was just some spontaneous occurrence that just so happened. Um, there, there was one statement that you made that it has been on my mind, and, and mm. I'm, I'm curious because uh, yes, pastorism... This is what this is for. Pastorism's drive me nuts. And, oh, boy. And Did I say one? That's, that's where pastors kind of throw something out. Oh. And it's like, oh, that sounds nice, but where did that come from? Mm. It, it, that, that just... That just and it, what it was is you said when, uh, when the Nile was turned to blood... Uh-huh. It was the blood of the newborn. So, you, so you're referencing back to the previous ah. week, and I'm ah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay. So, if it if I said it that way, I didn't mean it like literally. God is bringing back the blood of the newborns. Okay. That's not what I was trying to say. I'm more saying in those thematic tyings in together. Um, it's just like Mandy said. It's starting right back here where it's Moses's origin, but it's also a judgment against Egypt. Each of these is a judgment or a strike against Egypt, right? Where God is lashing out at them or attacking them. And the first touch point is in this place where these children of of His people have been killed, and so it's symbolically. This is in the same way like God has God says to Moses when he meets him in the in the burning bush around the burning bush. Uh, where does he say it? Okay. Uh, I have heard my people no. Where is it? Yeah, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land for uh, into a good and spacious land, all this stuff. So as he's going into those things, like I hear them crying out to me. And previously in Hebrews, we talked about like the, or uh, maybe that comes up later, the blood of um of Abel. Abel speaks of, mm. or the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than Abel because the blood of Jesus is poured out for the forgiveness of mm. many, whereas the blood of Abel is just innocent blood crying out against the injustice of being murdered. And, um, and so the, the better word there is that there's salvation in the spilled blood of Christ. In the, but it's uh, a tie-in with, you know, there's a thematic parallel there with the blood of Abel being spilled through the murder of his, by his brother. And so in this way, that's the same kind of thing I was talking okay. about, that like the, the place where innocent blood has been spilled, even though drowning babies doesn't exactly make the river bloody, but uh, maybe, I don't know, unless they were eaten by crocodiles. Like I think I did say that, <laughs> you know, because dumb middle school brain kicks in once in a while. <laughs> Mandy loves it when I do that. All the poor kids in our church service. <laughs> there were no... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, the 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 children the the again symbolically or metaphorically the blood of these children crying out to God is part of what God is coming back to address the horrors of the way Egypt is treating his, God's people the Israelites and from that place him going the first thing I'm going to do is fill the river with the blood that you've spilled. And so, like, with blood, because this is where you yeah. spilled blood. No, that, so that, no, that, so it's not, no, that totally makes it's sense. It's not like drop for drop, like, I took a DNA test, found <laughs> out, is Hebrew blood in the river? Like, that's not. 
Got it. No, that 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 totally makes sense. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. That was a meme was that reference a for all the young people out there. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, I'm not a young people. Because even with Cain, right, <laughs> the consequence for the murder, right? He, he's he's a gardener, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Right. And so the consequence is that the thing that he does for a living is no longer mm-hmm. going to produce. So, so fits the crime. Exactly. And so mm-hmm. to, to go the, the Nile, which is the source of life, mm-hmm. and you used it as a source of death, mm-hmm. now <laughs> you yeah. kind of get this reverberation of... Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That. Yeah. Right. So, so you have those themes. And, and then also the combo of like to start things off. To, to think about, like, like I love the, the Bible Project really got into this idea of decreation. And I mentioned that a little bit, but it was hard to really get mm-hmm. into it because it took them over. That podcast episode is over an hour, and they didn't even finish talking about the plagues. And it's just about the plagues and yeah. all the symbolism. But as they're going through all of that, to start with ruining the river, ruining the one major water source locally, ruining the way, their way of life, and, and to, to go from that into all these other things, um, even, even just in mentioning like, um, you know, as you look at the days of creation, like sin is, a, and they didn't quite say it this way, but like sin is essentially a twisting of things God has made, right? It's falling short or abusing or misusing things from the way they were created and designed to work. Um, and, and so even in that, the plague of frogs Frogs are a weird cross between land and water animals. And so it kind of like blurs the line between two days of creation in a way of bringing like, I'm going to use this hybrid thing to judge you and fill your house with death. Like the lines blurred kind of become this, the, this pile of stinky death in your house. And <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah, it just, uh, I, I thought that was kind of cool. Like, ooh, yeah, you know, and there's just like, it's not like, it would be dangerous to take a little thing like that and run with it as like a whole new basis for theology. Yeah, It's another to just acknowledge the depth at which God is judging Egypt. Like, and that, I think that's the key is just to look at like, this is like an onion. Ogres have layers, you know, and... Um, <laughs> And so as you're, as you're looking at that, like looking at all these layers of the onion being peeled away as God is judging Egypt, I think that's, that's the key when we look through the plagues and not just read through and be like, frogs were a weird choice and then move on, you know, but even like the gnats come up out of the dust and they bring death and suffering. God formed Adam out of the dust and breathed his life into him. And then, and so, you know, and the, the ruach, the breath of God, the wind that breathes life into them is what brings the flies and then sends them away. And so, like, there's all these different, like, little just connections. It's like, that's the same word. And in the same context of things of creation, that makes a big deal. And it just adds to this, like, you know, you have all of these things about, like, you don't get to participate in my creation. I'm going to undo creation around you until it collapses and you die. And then even more, you have raised up false gods and worshiped them as the source of power and blessing in each of these categories. I'm going to take each one of those and shoot down your God and show that I am the one. And you might be able to come up with a bad mimic of what I'm doing, but you cannot duplicate it fully and you cannot get rid of it on your own. And, and even when the magicians of Egypt are able to recreate or duplicate or copy some of the things God does, they can't get rid of them. They're like, we could do it too. Now make it go away. Uh, you want to talk to Moses about that one? That's more his department. Returns aren't, that's not us. We're in the sales team here. Um, so it, it just doesn't. Yeah, yeah, between that and that, what they were able to reproduce was less than. Like that. Yeah. But those two things, like if I'm Pharaoh and I'm looking at it, I'm going, okay, so they did it, but. <laughs> yeah. And a couple of times he looks at it and he's like, okay, well, they did it. Cool. I'm out. Like, and he gets super mad and he bails and he's just like, um, like the one with the, uh, the first one with the, with the blood. It's, you know, it says he, uh, um, you know, the Egyptian magicians did the same thing. Verse 22 of chapter seven. They did the same thing by their secret arts, and, the, and Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not even take this to heart. And it's just like, he's just like, nah, they did it too, whatever. 
piece and he and he leaves and, and it's such a like he's so pompous he's just looking for ways out of it and he's hardening his heart and sometimes it says god hardens his heart and sometimes he hardens his heart um but i think i think that's worth hitting too real quick without getting spending too much more time on that the the realities of this and the possibility of natural consequences versus miraculous engagement here. Um, one of them being, like I mentioned on Sunday, that um, there's kind of an accusation that like, well, God did this to Pharaoh. And so um, on the one hand, in Romans 9, I think it even says like, I'll bless who I bless and I'll curse who I curse. It's my choice. Uh, but also he's not picking like a righteous dude and going, watch me ruin him for my pleasure and enjoyment. You know, it's not like the angels are sitting around a big screen eating popcorn watching this and going like, oh, that was sick. You know, like like God is taking a guy who has already rejected him and turning that into uh, like, OK, great. Uh, you want to set yourself up as like claiming to be everything that I actually am. I can I can use you as the example. So I, I think uh, you said you wanted to keep that short but I, I think it was long uh, sorry well no um that's actually one of the things i've heard a lot in the past few years is from christians not even not even yeah. non-believers but christians of right. well you know god hardened pharaoh's heart and and it starts mm-hmm. off with pharaoh hardened pharaoh's heart and then there's a certain point where god just reinforces that um for me wrestling through that uh, i heard it I, i've heard it over the past few years and i heard it on Sunday from somebody else as well. So it's, it's not even like this is something I've heard in the past and it's, it's you know, we've, we've answered that and moved on. No, it's, yeah. it's an active right. um, thing. And so I, I think it's kind of important um, for me personally, where the difficulty with that comes in is when you talk about free will, right? Mm-hmm. I, I should have the freedom to make a choice. That's yeah. right. That isn't, isn't that what Bible says is it's, it's my choice to make. And I think there's a misunderstanding of how much freedom you actually have versus how much you don't actually have. Um, Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about God, God's sovereign. He is king. He says what is and what isn't. Um, The verses that that I've wrestled with are where it talks about God being the potter and us being the clay. Who are we to say to the potter, I am made for this purpose or that purpose? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's... He yeah. made us for a purpose. And some of those purposes are and for honor. And it's the honor. potter's prerogative to decide, you know, I'm done with this one. It didn't work out right. Cling. Yeah. And then start over. And some are made for an honorable purpose. Some are made for a dishonorable purpose. Right. Um, but it's ultimately his decision, his call yeah. as to what's going to happen. And I think that's the hardest thing internally mm-hmm. for me to grapple with is what sovereignty from God looks like and how to align my own understanding and my own will mm. with that of God in that context. Um, yeah. That, that's been a real struggle for, for me. Yeah. I think, well, Mandy, thoughts on that? I know you love the Calvinism versus Arminianism debate. <laughs> and, um, that's your favorite topic of study and, and discussion. So um, she's real big on it. Um, <laughs> podcast space. Podcast space. Space. <laughs> um, Also, that was a, a, I shook my head in sarcasm uh, font. Uh, for those of you who are listening to the podcast and can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm thinking of the silence on my end that they can't see either. Um, yeah, I would, I, I would love to hear what you think, Brian. Um, hmm. I am definitely more in the Arminian camp on things. Um, yeah. I think for me, um, this idea with the free will uh, and God hardening Pharaoh's heart here, it's not as if Pharaoh didn't have an opportunity to recognize God or acknowledge God or at any mm. point at the beginning of this whole thing um, yeah. to honor him or to choose to or to allow Israel to leave um, when Moses first comes in. And I think that the you know, remembering that there is like this spiritual element here that we're talking about, you know, Pharaoh, we're not just dealing with like a king, we're dealing with someone who really thinks that they are a deity themselves. And so um, I think that there is 
something different here that we're dealing with than if we're just looking like if we're just looking at another person doing something um and maybe maybe it's just escaping my mind but i can't think of a time where it says god hardens another person's heart is there another time in the bible that's a question is there another time i mean i know israel has hearts of stone and that they're given they're going to be given hearts of flesh i feel like yes Um, but i can't think of where and so yeah and i'm not i'm not yeah i can think of instances where Where obviously they have hardened hearts people have hardened hearts but but it's they've hardened their hearts no well not even that like i don't i don't know if it was them or god because it's just like by their actions, you can tell that yeah. there's something okay. wrong there. Um, I can't think off the top of my head of another. Mm. Mm. I, I feel like there is, but the overall... Because if, if Pharaoh is a deity like he claims to be, God can't harden his heart, right? But if God is actually the God of the universe and is almighty and powerful and sovereign, then he can because he right. is still a created thing that God has yeah. charge of. Well, there's, yeah, there's that. Um, yeah, because everything, including any spiritual beings, um, which would be called also Elohim in, uh, in the Old Testament, any spiritual thing, uh, spiritual entity is referred to as that. And, um, and so any of those are other than Yahweh are created by Yahweh. They're not equal to him. Right. They don't coexist eternally with him. Um, it's just him. And, um, but there's also like on that free will kind of thing, like Lucas said, I've had the same experience. Like it comes up a ton right now and in people's deconstruction journeys and all that kind of stuff, like that's a major sticking point. Like, hang on, like God chose to just ruin this guy. But like, that comes back to the same kind of thing about like the question of salvation and like, why would God send people to hell? And like, you are making a huge flawed starting point for your premise you are assuming that we all deserve heaven and that God then either neglects or ruins us to the point where we end up in hell and then punishes us unfairly there. Rather than, according to Scripture, I think it's in Matthew 25 where it says that God created the lake of fire for the devil and his angels. And at the judgment, at the final judgment, those who have rejected God get to go to that place with the other ones who rebelled against God. It's the new location for the people who have permanently rejected the Lord. If you reject God, you can join the devil and his angels who have all rebelled against God, who were created in, by him to be with him and to serve him. And they've all rebelled. And their ultimate punishment after wreaking havoc on the earth and being evil and opposed to the kingdom for all this time is destruction in this lake of fire, the second death. And he's like, and everyone else who rejects me, you can go there too. Like, that's the place for people who reject me. I have this great place for you, and I'm paying your way into it. You don't have to do anything to get there. It's up to me to do it. All you have to do to not get it is to reject the offer. Well, and that's, and that and that's where your choice state, is. Right, and that default state of by your, what you really deserve, because we've all sinned and rejected God, what we all really deserve is to go to that place. What we all really deserve is, what we've all really done is hardened our hearts. That's why in Ezekiel it says, I will take this heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. I will transform it and give you a heart transplant because you have a hard heart. That's another way of saying you have a hard heart. You, you stonified your heart. And you do not have a heart of flesh that beats with warmth and love and concern for others and for God and for for anything else. You you have this hardened, selfish, calloused heart that you won't allow. And God's like, I will transform it if you would just turn to me. But there's always that call to like, you have to turn in faith. The default state, the intended state of humanity is to be with God forever. The default state at this point between Adam and Eve's fall and Christ's second coming is we are all deserving of wrath. And by the grace of God, we don't always get it. And that's such a big shift that like 
is, is the fundamental difference and what makes it so difficult. Like if you don't catch and correct that stance first, it's really hard to talk through something like, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Why did God, um, you know, why does God send people to hell? All these kind of questions come out of this idea that like, because we're all really good and the only way Pharaoh could possibly be bad or deserving of bad is because God hardened his heart. No, God took an evil guy and said, hey, hey, Love it. Stay just like that. I got a plan for this. You refuse at every turn to show grace or mercy. You in, in, inflict injustice on my people at every opportunity. And then even without their provocation, all they did was exist. And Pharaoh's like, I got to stop that and starts killing them. They're already slaves. And he's like, nah, this is too much. We'll make it worse. Like, you guy you had a chance like you could have just coexisted he could have treated them like guests and then sent them on their way but he didn't do any of that and so it just he's not a good dude and whether or not pharaoh and he he shows no interest even in repenting there's not like like it'd be different if it was like and then pharaoh was like i really don't want to do this anymore god like this really hurts and i don't like it and god was like no i'm gonna punish you like that's not what happens pharaoh's like I hate you. Get out of my sight. And then when it finally, and then he's like, well, okay, maybe you could go in. And he starts trying to bargain it and cheat it. And like, I'll give in a little bit. And then every time he still goes back and he goes back on his word, keeps changing his mind, keeps going back on it. And finally it just gets to the point where I never want to see you again. If I see you again, I'll kill you. And Moses is like, you're right. You will never see me again. And then, you know, under his breath, probably like, I'm not going to one who's going to die though. Like, <laughs> You know, <laughs> next time you try to see me, you're going to die, you know? So, because that's what ends up happening. But um, the other piece, um, I think, of some of this is the uh, idea of whether or not these could happen by natural occurrence. And for some reason, I feel like it's, it's Christians who look for that a lot, which is weird to me. Like, like, I want to prove that this miracle is possible by showing you how it occurs in nature. And I remember reading an article one time where, every, where a bunch of people were really excited that they'd found this weird, like, it was something like a Katie did, you know, kind of a, like a big grasshopper-looking bug that lives in the desert in the Middle East, and it makes this, like, spit bubble foam stuff that kind of hardens into this, like, ri puffed rice cracker type thing. And they, they were like, we found manna. And I'm like... No, that's gross. Ugh. Also, it's not, <laughs> it's not manna. what I like, pictured manna it literally, tasting like. Like the whole point of manna is that it's a, a daily miracle for 40 years. Six, six out of seven days a week for 40 years straight and then not anymore. So, so who's the one that uh, taste tested that? That's, that's what I want to know. I know. Somebody was like, mm, grasshopper poop or like <laughs> foam. Grasshopper foam. I'm in. It's like a, what's that? Uh, Dare to not dare to share that evangelism. What's the organization? Uh, what's the show that was on the um, not Double Dare, but uh, the Fear Factor? That's oh, it. yeah, yeah, Fear Factor where they had to eat gross uh, things and they're like, here's hundred year old fermented duck eggs, like stuff like that. You know, like that seems like you're gonna eat like grasshopper butt foam from the desert. Like, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'll pass. I'll <laughs> Super good. Like, I don't want that money that bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> one, one of the oh. things that uh, I was thinking about as yeah. you were talking about this this idea is we've been going through the hall of faith and, yes. it, and it's by faith this person did something mm -hmm. that that was part of a positive and admirable but in the midst of a lot of those stories the, there are instances where they did things their own way yeah and so um, I, I think we have a tendency to go from one extreme to another either they they trust God or they don't trust God, and it's like there's there's iterations, and those those aren't like we're gonna mess up. Period. Um, we're gonna choose to do things our own way, um, even if in hindsight we go, "Oh, I wish I hadn't done that that way." Um, and I, I think this what's going on with Pharaoh is kind of like the opposite of the Hall of Faith. It's he's choosing instead of to live by faith in, in this God that's showing himself in very real, tangible ways that is confronting the entirety of Egyptian lifestyle. Like, it's not just Pharaoh that's being disrupted. It is ev literally everything yeah. is being disrupted. And still going, no, I, I, I got this. 
Like, right. like re- really? That's bold. <laughs> like, yeah. like there, there is an arrogance here that is just astronomical. I mean, even yeah. in my day to day, when things aren't going my way, it's like, okay, I need to stop and pause. And am mm-hmm. I the problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and mm, in here, we it's don't... It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. Yeah. In here, Pharaoh doesn't... At least not that it's, it's listed out. Pharaoh doesn't do that. Like, it's like, no, yeah. my guys are good. Uh, we know what we're doing. We got this. Uh, go away. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so... Um, but but that, that by faith thing is really important. Um, yeah. Because it, it's showing you these are the admirable ways. These are the things that God is looking for from his people right. is that by faith, they are living out their lives. And it's a daily choice. It is a, it is a moment by moment choice. And it's not just a one and done. You're good. And you right. don't have to worry about anything ever again because you got it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and not talking about salvation here. <laughs> right. But, no, but, even but the day to day leap living of it. Right. Yeah. It's all by faith. It's not, um, it, the faith in God to be the one who sanctifies us is what gives us sanctification. That the, it, and not in a transactional way, but in a, like, God doesn't force that on us. Uh, he doesn't sanctify people who aren't into it. He, he only takes those who place their faith in him. And that's what this is going through is showing that, like, your faith and trust in God is the same um, but in a more fulfilled and, and immediate way as the, the hope that these, one, that these people uh, from the Old Testament are um, you know, placing their faith and trusting in God according to those things. Um, and I did find where it first mentions that uh, Pharaoh's not going to let them go. It's in chapter 3 of Exodus when Moses is talking to him. And God says, I'll stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians. Oh, uh, he says, um, go do all this and, um, you know, tell them, tell them you want to go and make sacrifices. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Like, I've watched this guy. I've seen this guy. I know him. I made him, and he's terrible, and he rejects me. And there's no way he's going to let you do this without this. And God's not guessing. He's not banking on Pharaoh being that way. He's not going, because I already rigged the game. He's going, I know know things about him that he doesn't even know, he won't do it. He will not repent. And, um, you know, and I feel like there's a lot of people like that today too. That's another thing is like some people are like, well, show me one shred of evidence for this thing. And it's like, dude, evidence could like literally come out of your hair right now and you would ignore it or explain it away. Like, and, and Israel does that. And we see that, we see that throughout scripture. We see that in our own lives, little ways that we reject and walk away. And so like, if you're determined to not believe or follow any of this, like there's no amount of convincing, no power from heaven is going to convince you. Pharaoh's watching all these miracles and where Moses's faith is strengthened, Pharaoh's doubling down against it. And like that, it doesn't bring him around. It doesn't bring him into that place. Um, and the the last um, the last piece of like real history kind of thing on Sunday somebody had asked and, it, and it's here in the chat on Instagram as well. Um, what uh, does Egypt acknowledge the history of enslaving Hebrews for 450 years? Like now, is that part of their history? Like let's learn ancient Egyptian history and like is it a historical fact in Egypt yeah, that they did like this? are they going to teach you that in an Egyptian hi- history book that's a really good question i don't have an answer they don't they don't they don't acknowledge it there are egyptologists who have a parallel account that makes sense for all of this and some timelines that do make sense for it um, but the because they're operating on their own timelines and their own records for all of it, they actually are just out of alignment by a couple hundred years. Mm. And so I feel like you were one of the ones who came and talked about this in, in student ministry, like way back in the day. Like, and then we had the guy from like either reasons for hope or answers in Genesis or Genesis apologetics or one of those, yeah. one of those guys was talking about all the timelines and stuff. And like, didn't you came and did a session? No, like I, I, I did. Anyway. I was doing uh, what was I doing? I was doing, um, the Christ myth was oh what yeah I yeah, yeah that's right oh because that's what you had like done your yeah the paper on it everything yeah so no, um, no this is this is actually but, a great thing because I'm I actually see Christians do the same thing like yeah. looking at the timeline it's like you guys are you guys are off like there, there's mm-hmm. there's something you're trying to conform with 
like the accepted, this is when everything happened, right. not actually looking at what's going on. Uh, one of the things that when it, when it comes to this kind of thing uh, that I remember very clearly is the idea that when um, between the time of Joseph and the time of Moses, mm -hmm. there was a regime shift. Mm. There was mm -hmm. a conquering of Egypt yeah. by another nation, essentially, that took over. And so when it says there was a pharaoh that did not know, it's, it's not just because they failed to you know, like hand down oral history. It was like, no, there was a complete shift of culture right. and everything else because there was this new conquering nation that came in right. and then looked at what was there and went, um, this isn't good. Yeah. And on a heck, uh, on a hecular, on a, on a heckin' crazy, uh, <laughs> on a secular history reality, when you get into these ancient times and the way that nations operated with stuff like that, they would do, and you see it with um, Alexander the Great, um, the Hellenization and the Hellenized Jews and all of this, their plan was in all of these places, they would destroy any record of this, of anywhere they conquered and rewrite those histories and make themselves up and retell the stories and all of this. And, you know, so there's some reality to that kind of thing too, that we can see all throughout history where, you know, like, oh, well, you know, it's always the victors that get to write the story. And like, there's some truth to that. We can still find things. But so then it, it gives a lot of credibility to the discrepancies in the timeline when you see things in Egypt's history that absolutely line up with and allow for the exact events we're talking about and multiple encounters as well as like there's a whole time where Egypt comes up to war again later um, in the time of the kings. There's a time where Egypt comes to war against Israel, uh, uh, partnered with, allied with some other nations. And you have those things and those are split evenly on Egypt's timeline, but everything's shifted a bit out of order with what the Bible claims. And if you allow for where's the fluidity in the timeline uh, according to scripture and where's the fluidity in the timeline according to these things and you, and you line them back up, you go, but these events match up in those same chunks properly. And then the archeology span also um, explains that. But um, well, it's also... funny because the same people who are like, well, you know, you would have evidence of if you had all these people crossing the desert for 40 years, you'd have all this evidence and blah, blah, blah. And you'd have all this stuff and there'd be all this trash. And like one, no, you wouldn't like you don't find that much stuff throughout, um, you know, of, Na of Native Americans all over. Like it's hard to find artifacts because they were a people who used absolutely everything. You're not going to find a can times. of beans. Right. Exactly. <laughs> You're not going to find or, like a can. Or leftover manna. Yeah. And so... <laughs> When it comes to Egypt, you have a, uh, or Israel wandering in the desert, you have similar kinds of, of things where part of the reason you don't find as much is they're really efficient in using everything to its fullest potential being, you know, out there. They're not just like leaving, like uh, I carved out all the top sirloin and then I left the rest of the cow laying there to rot in the wilderness. Like, you know, they use everything. Well, they also so. didn't need to eat cow because they had other food, Man right? Quest. I mean, they didn't need a, like, they no, didn't... They took tons of livestock with them and stole more from Egypt. As they oh, that's left, a good point. Or so, received more. So they're like, please go, take everything, we don't care. Right. The, the other piece of, of the historicity, and it, it goes in with what you mentioned about what was believed of Pharaoh, that he was a god. You, you have this instance that happens later where Pharaoh, his army gets wiped out like that is that is a dramatic that is a huge loss but how much more so when it's your god that just got wiped out yeah. like how do you how do you recover from that what do you right like was was he not who we thought he was <laughs> like <laughs> that's where well, the next guy takes out takes over and call claims what happened with david and saul like oh the gods have appointed me and pharaoh was the false representation and yeah. now i'm the pharaoh and i take over and it's this seamless transition where then he's like and let me rewrite his history a little bit because he kind of messed up and now and you I'm need not, to kind of like justify everything that. and make exactly. it exactly and and so it's it's not surprising when you look back at records that they don't quite line up it, it makes sense for how humans work, yeah. and just in general. I mean, you have a, a corporation today that has some sort of moral failing in their in their uh, board or whatever, and it's yeah. like, how can we recover from this? How can we continue to move forward even though we've, we've just lost the faith of the people, right? Exactly, right. exactly. So 
So yeah, so there, there's all of that, and, and that, um, that brings us to, okay, so living and sharing the gospel of peace, um, uh, which, uh, the, the rough segue, it's fine. Okay, so, <laughs> but, but looking at the practicalities of this and, and where it really applies um, to us, where it really leaves us some application, um, like I'd said on Sunday, it, there's not a whole lot of, hey, we're going to, um, you, you know, we're going to, when we face Pharaoh next week, Everybody, you know, like, you know, this isn't a pep talk for going to war against Egypt or something. Uh, this is about uh, recognizing that there is one true and living God, the one who was, is, and is to come. And, uh, and I love that that was something that three-time mention was something that the Bible Project had mentioned. And then when I was looking for it, and then when I looked into the commentaries, one thing I came across while researching it deeper was rabbinical commentary that validated that. And that's where, that was the first guys to come up with that was before Jesus. And so it was like, oh, oh that's so good. Like, that's right there. And, and how could we not uh, have, you know, like, I mean, we have acknowledged that, but like, man, how... How do they skip over that and go like, no, but, you know, it can't line up. But so knowing the God who was and who is and who is to come and coming back to Moses's original uh, or the statement from Hebrews that leads us to this conversation with, about Moses. By faith, he left Egypt. Um, we're not leaving Egypt, but by faith, do hard things, do scary things, not afraid of the world and the powers of this world. We can persevere because we see him who is invisible because we have encountered and met him. We're filled by the Holy Spirit of the God who is invisible, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I think that becomes a pretty powerful call to us as well that like where, and I think that's probably why it's stated that way is like, like we can do crazy difficult things in faith, trust and not being afraid of the powers and, and threats of this world because we know the God who is invisible. Like, what are you going to come at me with? What do you have that can outdo God? Yeah, and yeah. I, I think the thing, too, that's important to remember when you say we can do things and not be afraid is that this isn't like I can go skydiving now because... You Why know, not? God. Let's go skydiving. I mean, but, but that's not what <laughs> okay. we're talking about. You know, like, it's not fear of doing whatever, yeah. you know, um, right. God had a purpose in all of this. And he, when he's talking to Moses and he says, I'm hardening Pharaoh's heart, he says, so that you will know mm. that I'm God. Yeah. Right. And so there's like an intention behind us having this type of faith that Moses has having this type of faith that I'm sorry, guys, I keep jumping cause there's loud noises outside. <laughs> loud noises. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you might not be able to hear them, but I can. We don't can. have to fear anything. Loud noise. Ah! Ah! Um, you don't have to, Well, okay, but... Oh, shoot. I lost my train Sorry. of thought. Um, but um, it, it's to a purpose and an end, which is God's purpose and God's end. And that's not necessarily to say, like, I don't have to fear anything. I can now go do this crazy, reckless thing with my life. Um, but that I know, but I don't have to fear the things of this world because the God who did all of these things is yeah. for us, has a purpose for us and an intention for our life in this world. And that call is not just to go do whatever we want, but to live in a way that, that reflects him and who he is in this world. And so if we are living in a way that reflects this powerful, mighty God that has power over all of these things to act and to do all of these things, then how do we live right. our lives in light of that faith? Right. Exactly. So go ahead and answer that one, Brian. Go ahead. Oh, then how? Yeah, do we how do, it? do we do it? And like, I mean, and I, th and at I think the we trust God over anything. Like when we look at, like when you and I were looking at, you know, moving all the times we did. Every time we've resigned from a church and been like, "What's your plan?" Literally, don't have one. Like what? God is calling us. We know that part. We're trusting in Him and we're taking steps forward. We're living in faith, not being afraid of things like, "But how are you going to pay your bills after you're done here?" I have no idea. <laughs> but I think he's going to provide because he's calling us into something. And if he calls us into that so that we can starve, like somehow if that's his plan, I'm willing to follow and see where it goes. Right. Like he doesn't call us out into the wilderness to 
die. No, that's Israel's complaint. Yeah. And I, like, I'm trying to learn from their example. Like, you brought us out here to die. Literally, no, he didn't. Which is later. Like, I'm leading story. you to the promised land. I love that, like, the destination is the promised land. And immediately they're like, you just brought us out here to die. It's like, but, did, did you not see what just happened? Like, did you already forget? Like, why is your cart heavy right now? Because it's full of stuff that you looted from, Israel, from Egypt on your way out. Why did you get to loot them when you were a slave last week? Oh, well, wait, the God who brought you out here did not bring you out here to die rich in the desert. <laughs> and I think you're yeah. on to something with that, too. Like, you know, he saw the invisible God, right? Like, he met yeah. the invisible God. And so he, and now this invisible, invisible God has made himself known through these very visible acts that he did mm-hmm. in Egypt. He's proven his power. He's proven his might. He's proven his trustworthiness. And yet it's so easy to forget. But I think today as Christians, the really big question for us is, do you actually believe that God did these things and is capable of doing them? Because if we really believe that, how much more do we really trust that, yeah, he's going to come through? Yeah. And and that's where... And Lucas definitely has a thought on that. So the, just the quick, definitely yeah. have a thought on that. The, the quick thing I want to say is that's where the theology of churches these days that starts erasing the historicity of Scripture, including like, well, we don't really believe in a bodily resurrection. If you don't, according to Paul, you're not actually a Christian. Yeah, ancient Sorry. heresy. Uh, <laughs> we've already dealt with this right. years right. ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, no, I I was. Where I find the difficulty is not in what God has done. Mm. It's with what he will do with me. Because I look, at the, I look at the story of Egypt, and I see where it went with Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Impacts everybody, hands down, everybody. I don't think that my story impacts everybody. And so it's hard to go, like, at what, what value is is there for God to place that kind of effort in my life? Is my story that important? Mm. Um, currently, I'm going through this this phase of waiting, and I, and it, it almost feels like I'm playing chicken with God. Like, mm-hmm. who's going to move first? Who's going to? And and I've already lost. Like, I I lose because God has eternity, and I have just a finite time. <laughs> so yeah. so if I move at any point and not wait on the Lord to do something first, then I've, I've lost. And so, so like, there's, there's some background insight that I have that's like, okay, so allow God to move. Just, yeah. it, it's hard. Look at the Israelites in the desert 40 years, right? They're, they're waiting. Mm-hmm. A lot of that's their own fault. Like, <laughs> this is the result of their own action. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, just the, the pressure and the tension of knowing that I'm supposed to be waiting but feeling the outside pressure to move and act, whether it's pressure from family, uh, whether it's, you, you brought this up, the, the pressure to provide for my family. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't bring that up, me up specifically, but the concept. Same thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From stage, he was like, Lucas, you. <laughs> yeah. No. Yo, he man, you he better didn't be. Do that. He no. didn't yeah, do well, that. And, and Jen goes, way to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, nice. but it's like, I, I need to, I need to, set that discomfort aside yeah. and know that God is sovereign, that he is faithful. And even in, even in that like uncertainty, because it's, it's very easy in hindsight to look and go, oh, this yeah. is how God, this is how God got this person out. And, and I look at other people, like I look at people who don't know the Lord mm-hmm. and how the Lord has moved within their lives, mm. even if they won't acknowledge it, even yeah. if they don't see it. And you're like, would you just pay attention <laughs> right? for a second? And so, so I know that he's faithful. I know that like it'll be okay. Right. There, and I, and I, I'm believing that the reason why he doesn't act is because he doesn't have to. It's mm. there's no threat to him. Mm-hmm. And, and oh, I have to do it right away because it, if I don't, that, it's like no, he's sovereign God. Yeah. Like he, he, he doesn't. There's no threat there. And going True. back to the Egyptians, the Egyptian gods, there was no threat from the Egyptian gods on who God was. <laughs> right. Like it wasn't like oh no, I got to wipe them out early because they're 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 growing. <laughs> like yeah. like Pharaoh responded. It's like yeah. no, this is. It's funny in in my skeptical response brain. 
I, I think of Babel where God's like, they're going to become too much like us. Like there, there's going to be no end to what they do if they s- keep working together like this to build the tower of Babel. But the, the thing about that, the danger there is not to God, it's to them. Yeah. The, the danger is to humanity. And he's like, I need to save them from themselves because this is not going to go well if they completely replace any concept of need for me. Um, but, but as you're saying that too, I think there's a piece that, um, in that question of like, is my story that significant? Like globally, maybe not world history wise, probably not as far as like, we're not going to write another chapter of scripture. That's going to include your life. Like no matter what happens, Billy Graham's not getting another chapter of scripture to describe his crusades and all that stuff. Like none of that comes from that, but there's validation of this story when we look and see a consistency in our lives now in how God operates and in what we go through in serving and following the Lord. And we go, Oh, same thing. Got it. Still, still humans struggling to follow and interact with the living God. Okay. I can identify with them and that story can speak validity. And, and when I look at it and go in my story, here's where, Here's where I feel like a failure. Here's where I see myself failing. Here's where I feel like I'm waiting on God and go, oh, and I see the, um, both the camaraderie of those who have gone before and struggled through that dry place of, uh, of um, waiting on answers and deliverance from God. Uh, and so there's a bit of that. But then there's also the individual, um, like you said, like God's not under threat of that, but is it, isn't it enough that God has promised you and, and gifted you what he has given. And, and so there's, um, in, well, and that's in what's the, difficult is being able to see and, those promises. Right. And, and that's always been like kind of a blind side for me is not seeing uh, them yeah. to be able to rely on them and Fair. go, Oh, even Fair. though they're there. Yeah. Right. But it's just like my own blindness. Yeah. And, and well, I mean, we're called to remember what the Lord has done and we may right. be getting into that a little bit with Passover this yes. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't go says, too far with that. Says the one who's teaching it next week. Here you week, go, so. Lucas. Keep, God right. just keeps well, no, right this, there for this, you. This, honestly, right. going, so. through, going, going through Hebrews has been a week by week. It's like, oh, this? Okay, so let's start working yeah. through this. Now this? Okay. How do these relate yeah. together? See, like, and, yeah. and that's the point is like, you know, with each of these things, like I don't care if anybody remembers exactly what I talked about this week or two weeks ago. I, I barely remember like which point was what then, but these constant realignments of like, this is how we follow God mm-hmm. and, and constantly being checked and pointed and, and continued on just like my car doesn't need to remember every oil change, just that the oil change has kept happening. So the engine keeps running the way it's supposed <laughs> to and the car alignment, the wheels are aligned. Like it doesn't matter like what the, I mean, it's a human being who worked on it. So he matters, but like, it's not about like which guy's name worked on the car. It's, that the car has been put back in proper working order to go straight on the way it's, it needs to go to keep it going in the same way. Like that's the goal here is like reading through Hebrews. We see by faith, here are people engaging things. And when they've gone through something harder and bigger than what we go through, then when I face something that is equally as important to me in that moment, but not as big a thing, I can go, well, if God can show up there, like I can trust him in this place and the individual. And that was the third thing I was going to say about what you were saying about your situation, the testimony to your family and to friends and and to those who will see you, the testimony to coworkers and people you interact with who see your faithfulness in that it may not have global impact, but it has eternal impact. And that is valid and important and necessary and why there is specific purpose in each person who, who's willing to sign on. God has purpose and meaning and intent for each person's life through that. So, yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up another episode, I think. Of, uh, of the PAX podcast, living and sharing the gospel of peace. Uh, if you like this, whatever platform you're on, if it has commenting, comment. Let us know your thoughts. Ask any other questions, that kind of thing. If uh, it has a share button or a rating, give us a rating. Let Anything you do like that, any way you engage, um, if you give it whatever stars, if you give it a review, if you share it with somebody, all those things, tell you know whoever's hosting it or sharing it or distributing it, whatever platform you're engaging on, it tells that platform that this is something you want to see. So if you like this, engage with it in whatever ways are available to you, and that helps other people see it as well. Um, but more than anything, we hope that this is something that um, 
has helped point you more toward Christ and helped uh, open up the scriptures a little more for you to be able to read and understand and uh, live according to them uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So for Mandy and Lucas, I am Brian. This is the PAX Podcast. Be rad for Jesus.